Um, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and um, to be visiting your beautiful city for these two days. I had a beautiful flight over um, from the East Coast and beautiful clear weather, and it's really magnificent here, as you know. Um, so I wanted to talk about uh, uh, the ancient DNA revolution, which has unfolded over really the last eight years and maybe even really within the last four years, um, which is really profoundly changing our understanding of who we are, how we're related to different people in the world today, and how each population in the world that exists got to where it is today. And I think if there's a single take home message of this talk, it's that profound mixture of people who are very different from each other is not just a phenomenon in the last 500 years in the Americas, but is in everybody's history and no population uh, is or, or could really ever be pure in any sense. So I'm going to begin by talking about the disruptive power of ancient DNA, um, and by someone who for me is really a, a mentor, or, or not a mentor exactly, but like a, 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 an inspiration, Luca Cavalli-Sforza, who died last month. Um, and in 1960, uh, he made a bet that it might be possible to reconstruct the history of human populations around the world, how they got to where they are today, by comparing the genetic variation in groups living today to each other. Um, and the idea was that if people moved to each place in the world where they are today uh, and just stayed there after that point without mixing very much, then the people who live in each part of the world today should be direct representatives of those ancestral population and by measuring how closely related people are to each other, we can build a tree of relationships and determine the branching pattern that brought people to each part of the world today. So on the basis of this type of idea, he analyzed genetic variation beginning in 1978 from uh, di diverse European people and looked at the type of genetic data that was available at that time, which was protein polymorphism data. So this was blood group variation. So for example, your ABO blood group system or your rhesus blood group system that's measured in your blood and that people look for determining antibody matches. And by looking at the frequencies and how they differ in different populations around the world, he saw that the primary gradient of variation in Europe today moves in a southeast to northwest direction, like you see in this plot. And he interpreted this as the genetic imprint of the movement of farmers into Europe, which we know from archaeology occurred sometime after 9,000 years ago from Turkey or Anatolia and moved eventually to the British Isles uh, within a few thousand years. And so what he thought he was seeing is the dilution of ancestry from those first farmers from Turkey by mixing with local hunter-gatherers as they moved through the region. Now with ancient DNA, when we could actually measure the proportion of farmer ancestry, you see the proportion of farmer ancestry is actually highest in southern or even southwestern Europe and decreases in the opposite perpendicular direction. And that's because people have moved. That's because there was a later major event or multiple events that have changed that pattern. And so it's actually not possible to reconstruct human history based on patterns of variation today because people have moved and removed and mixed and migrated again and again and again. And I'm going to tell you some evidence for that. So I'm going to begin by talking about this new scientific instrument of ancient DNA, and it begins with an ancient human skeletal remain, for example, a bone or a tooth, in a clean room where the goal is to protect this tooth from the people who are handling it, the archaeologists and the lab people who are handling it, who have much more DNA than is still in the bone, and a little bit of DNA from you can overwhelm the DNA that's left in the sample. So we take a number of measures like gloves and face masks and clean suits and purified air and positive pressure and ultraviolet light to protect the sample. We drill beneath the surface of the bone with a dental drill or another type of implement. We extract powder. We release DNA from the powder in a watery mix that removes the protein and mineral content. And we convert the DNA fragments, which are short and degraded, but still long enough in some cases to sequence into a form that can be sequenced in one of these modern sequencers. In the late 2000s, there was a jump in DNA sequencing technology, which made it possible to sequence DNA for literally a million times less expensively than it was the case two decades ago. And this has made it possible to whole genome sequence modern humans, but also ancient humans. So here's a 
not related to genetics, but Moore's law, which many people here might be familiar with, which is the doubling of density of uh, transistors or, 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 or other operational elements on electric circuits uh, over the last century or so, um, which has doubled every one or two years um, and has driven a lot of the computer revolution. So there's an even more dramatic increase in ancient DNA data. Uh, the first ancient DNA was published in 2010. It reached 10 in 2012. It passed 100 in 2015, and only this year it reached 1,000. And there's a lot of unpublished data as well. And so this orders of magnitude increase in the amount of data makes it possible to ask and answer questions about the past that simply were not possible to uh, answer before. So I'm now going to sort of briefly give a little bit of information about how the genome reveals the past um, and can be used to reveal the past. And so the data that we're looking at to look at human history can be thought of as follows. So you see on the left of this picture, there's a picture of a human cell in stylized form, inside of which is a nucleus, which contains your 23 pairs of chromosomes. So you get one chromosome from each of your parents, your mother and your father, and um, for example, and and inside a cell is a nucleus. Most cells have 23 pairs. So here's a blow up of those 23 pairs. And if you blow it up even further, you'll see the famous double helical strand. And this will be con con composed of a strings of adenine, cytosines, thymines, and guanines, the four letters of DNA, A, C, T, and G. And so there's 3 billion of these in all, approximately. And what we actually do when we look at the human history is we line up two sequences. For example, the sequence of DNA you get from your mother and the sequence of the DNA you get from your father. And humans are extremely similar to each other. So if you look at the DNA copies you have in you, one from your mother and one from your father, they're almost identical. 99.9% .9 of the positions in the DNA that you can line up, the letters, are identical. But 0.1% are different due to mutations that occurred randomly in the past since your mother and father share a common ancestor. And 1.1% of 3 billion is 3 million differences, and that's a lot of information. So what we do, for example, is you can look in positions in the genome where there are few differences between your mother and father, and that tells you there's not been much time since your mother and father share a common ancestor then because mutations occur at a pretty constant rate over time. If you see a stretch with few differences, it means that there's a relatively recent ancestor. My brother and I have large sections of the genome where we have no differences at all from each other because we share an immediate common ancestor. On the other hand, there are places where there's a high density of mutations reflecting a typical time to the common ancestor that's very far back in the past. Typical time to the common ancestor between two human sequences, for example, your mother's and father's sequences at a random place in your genome, is about one to two million years. So how can the genome reveal the past? So if you take your uh, DNA and you say, how many ancestors is your DNA coming from? Well, it's coming from two parents, so that doesn't seem like a lot of ancestors, but then that's coming from four grandparents and eight great-grandparents and 16 great-grandparents, so there's this exponential increase in the number of ancestors. And then the DNA itself is getting fragmented into those parents. Uh, it breaks about... Um, about uh, 70 times per generation due to the splicing together of mother's and father's DNA that occurs when you produce an egg or a sperm. And so it starts in 46 or 47 chunks, your chromosomes and your mitochondrial DNA, and it adds about 70 every generation. So what's happening is that your genome is fragmenting into more and more ancestors, adding 70 fragments per generation. And by about uh, uh, 10, 10 or... Um, uh, generations or so, it's fragmented into more fragments than there are ancestors. Or, uh, uh, or, um, and so you're actually, there are ancestors who didn't even contribute any DNA to you. Um, but what this is telling you is that if you go back far enough into the past, you have thousands of independent ancestors, and your genome is allowing you to find information from all of those ancestors. So you're not one person, you're actually a multitude of people, and by sequencing your genome, you're averaging together many ancestors, and you could find quite powerful information. So my talk is about um, four, structured around four examples about how the genome revolution in the last few years is showing us that we're wrong again and again and again about our understanding of who we are. 
So the first example I'm going to tell you about is our wrong assumption about that we all came from Africa in the last 50 or 100,000 years. So it's mostly true. 98% uh, of the ancestry of non-Africans is from Africa. But actually, there was mixture with local humans. And I came into this work, for example, in 2007 quite convinced that the genetic data had shown that all of the ancestry of non-Africans today was entirely from Africa within 50 to 100,000 years. In fact, I was part of the scientific lineage of people who had demonstrated that, although I didn't play a particular role, role in that. So the context for this is that the first skeletons of anatomically modern humans, people who look like us, appear in the African fossil record about 300,000 years ago. Um, and then uh, after 100,000 years, or especially 50,000 years ago, explode out of Africa into different parts of Eurasia. But those parts of Eurasia were not empty of people. The first Neanderthals, who are archaic humans whose brains were as large as ours, who made tools as complex as our own ancestors did at the same time, were spread across Europe and Western Asia at the same time. So a question was always, when we found the evidence archaeologically of the spread of modern humans out of Africa after 50,000 years ago, was there interbreeding when they encountered each other? And if there was interbreeding, where did it happen? So what we did as in collaboration with our colleagues in Germany who were sequencing the genome was we developed a test for whether interbreeding had occurred. And the basic test that we developed was extremely simple, so I'll explain it now. So if you line up a genome sequence, this is supposed to represent one of your 23 chromosomes from a European person and a Nigerian person, and you look at a place where they differ in their DNA letter, a thiamine or a guanine, and then you lift the veil, you look at the Neanderthal sequence, does it want, match one more than the other? What we see is that Neanderthals match Europeans more than they do Nigerians. It's not just Europeans, it's also East Asians, it's not just Nigerians, it's also any, any sub-Saharan African population. So this is evidence of gene flow, which we established in various ways, specifically of Neanderthal contribution to the ancestors of all non-Africans uh, in about the same proportion. So we replaced, uh, in this analysis, we compared a Nigerian to a French person, um, but in, uh, and then we, could, then we replaced the, the, the French person with a second Neanderthal. And we asked how much of the skew that you see in a French person is compared to what you see if you replace it with a second Neanderthal. And that allows you to say how far of the way is a French person or another non-African person to a complete Neanderthal. And when you do this, it's about 2% of the way. And so this allows us to obtain an accurate and correct, we think, measurement of the proportion of ancestry of non-Africans that's from Neanderthals. It's about 2%, but significantly higher in East Asians than it is in Europeans, which is a real effect, and we know what explains it. I could tell you afterward what explains that. So once we had this observation, we wanted to know how long it's been since the mixture occurred between Neanderthals and modern humans. And the way we did this is, again, by looking at uh, the segments of DNA. So here in population two, it might be Neanderthals is green. Population one is red. There's two stripes here, which are the chromosomes on which your DNA is packaged. For example, two copies of your chromosome three. If you have a kid with someone who's a Neanderthal, you'll have, that kid will have one entirely Neanderthal, one entirely modern human chromosome. And when you produce an egg or a sperm, you produce spliced together chunks of your parents' DNA, and you get these mosaic patterns. And many generations later, you just chop it up. And by looking at the dice size of the chunk size of these fragments, you can learn how long it's been since the mixture started between these two parents. It actually is a very accurate way of estimating the age since mixture. So when we analyzed this and looked for the sizes of segments of shared ancestry between Nigerians and Neanderthals, they were very small measured on this plot of the length versus the size of the ancestry. But in French people, it was much larger, reflecting the, the recent mixture. And then we also had data that we later gathered from a 40,000, 5,000-year-old modern human who lived close in time to the mixture event. And for this individual, that individual lived within five to 10,000 years of the mixture. So by looking at the sizes of these segments of sharing with Neanderthals, especially of ancient individuals who were close in time to the event, we now have a rather precise date of when the Neanderthal mixture occurred into modern humans, which is between about 54 to 49,000 years ago. That's when it happened. So the conclusions is that at that time, 54 to 49,000 years ago, there was interbreeding from Neanderthals into the ancestors of all non-Africans, and that population spread out across Eurasia, bringing the Neanderthal admixture with it 
to spread throughout the rest of Eurasia. So in 2010, just as we were publishing these findings about Neanderthal, we also, our colleagues in Germany, obtained DNA from this place in Siberia, southern Siberia, Denisova Cave, a finger bone of a little girl. We could tell it was a little girl because the growth plates were not fully formed in the finger bone, so it was a child, and you can tell it's a girl because of the DNA. It has no Y chromosome and two X chromosomes. And there was also a big tooth from an adult that had DNA similar to the finger bone. When we looked genetically at how closely related it is to the other Neanderthals and to the modern humans, it's more closely related to Neanderthals than to modern humans, but not particularly close to Neanderthals, this Denisova specimen. It's actually separated by many hundreds of thousands of years from Neanderthals. So what we had identified was a new population, neither Neanderthal nor modern human, but a third population altogether. So this was very exciting and amazing. And of course, we did the same test. We took different pairs of modern human populations, like people from New Guinea, people from China, and other pairs. And we said, does Denisova match some more than others? And when we did this analysis, we saw that Denisova matched specifically New Guineans more than any other group. And it was a highly significant effect. And when you further did more analysis, we could estimate that this Denisovan population, or one distantly related to it, contributed 4 to 6 percent of the ancestry of New Guineans and nearby populations, and very little ancestry in the mainland. So this is the proportion of Denisovan ancestry we subsequently estimated in diverse populations around the world. It's 5% in New Guinea, and this is, so a full pie represents 5%, and maybe a 20th of that in East Asians and almost nothing in Europe and in Africa. So the conclusion is that Neanderthals mixed into the ancestors of non-Africans as they spread 50 to 100,000 years ago out of Africa. Then there was a further mixture on the way to peopling New Guinea um, of 4 to 6%. Just published, uh, not by us, but by another group uh, a month or two ago, uh, by this group in Germany, is another sample from Denisova Cave who's, uh, of an individual who has a Neanderthal mother and a Denisovan father. And so this is an individual who's in the result of interbreeding between group, two groups separated by many hundreds of thousands of years. We estimate four or 500,000 years and produce this child who happened to have leaved, left a bone that has been sequenced and we have their full genome sequence. So what's actually happened with this ancient genetic data is it's opened a whole Pandora's boxes of mixtures that we didn't know about. It identified the Denisovans that we didn't even know about before. There's no clearly documented fossil record or archaeology of them the way there is with the Neanderthals, but we now know about them, and we know that they interbred in ways that we had not anticipated before. We've identified multiple mixture events between different modern human Denisovan and Neanderthal and lineages altogether different like this one that's contributed to the Denisovans. And so it's quite clear that the past 50 or 60,000 years ago was one full of archaic humans and modern humans interacting with each other and when they were in close proximity producing children. So that was the first example of how we were wrong about our understanding of the past, the simple understanding being um, disproven by the genetic data once we look at it. Now, a second lesson is uh, given by the history of West Eurasians, or whites. So, uh, what we, uh, which is that the population that people think of as whites simply didn't exist 10,000 years ago. Um, so if you look in Western Eurasia, uh, uh, Europe, um, the Near East, Central Asia, today, genetically, people are pretty similar to each other. The level of differentiation between people from Iran and people from England, for example, is maybe a tenth of that between Europeans and East Asians. And that's given rise to the idea that these people might be broadly part of the same group. So we collected and published in 2016 data from diverse people from the last 10,000 years across this region. And if you measure the average differentiation 10,000 years ago on this top row between these people across this region on this scale, which is just the average frequency difference of these genetically variable positions between two populations, it's about 0.1, which is about the level between Europeans and East Asians. So 10,000 years ago across West Eurasia, if you take random populations, the level of differentiation was quite large, similar to Europeans and East Asians. Today, it's a tenth of that. And it collapsed by a factor of three already by 6,000 years ago. And then it collapsed yet again to approximately present day levels by about 4,000 years ago. And so how did that happen? One possibility you might imagine is that of the ancient populations that exist, one expanded and displaced the others. But that's not what happened. 
what happened is this. So we now have pretty accurate models for the history of the ancestry of West Eurasians based on all the ancient DNA data we have. And we know that present day West Eurasians are comprised of mixtures of four ancestral populations. You can think of them, some of them as Iranian early farmers that we have genetic data from, from about nine or 10,000 years ago. Uh, Levantine farmers, people from present day Jordan and Israel, for example, from about the same time. Western European hunter gatherers, uh, so people who were, have been hunter gatherers in Spain or Britain or Central Europe, and Eastern European hunter gatherers from the Eastern part of Europe. And those populations did not disappear, instead, they mixed with each other. Um, and the reason that there's low levels of differentiation across West Eurasia today was this profound mixing that occurred. So the third lesson in humility um, is that large-scale migration was common in our past. And so there's been a prevailing view in uh, archaeology uh, by in many people that movement, that when you see changes in material culture and the types of pots people make and the types of artifacts people left behind, um, uh, people have argued for 100 years about what that reflects. Does it reflect movements of new people in, or does it reflect communications of ideas? Does it, it reflect new fads that are spreading? And recently, in the last 50 years, there's been a lot of um, uh, favoring of ideas where the changes are thought to be often due to spreading of ideas, not to movements of people. But of course, with ancient DNA, you can actually look to test whether that occurred. That's exactly what ancient DNA lets you do. You excavate an ancient grave. It's associated with an archaeological culture. It has some pots that are characteristic that are grave goods inside the, inside the grave. And you compare it to other ancient DNA samples and to people living today. And with great precision, because of the large number of ancestors each person has, you can get a precise measurement of how that individual is really related to under their individuals. That's what it allows us to do. So I'll show you how ancient DNA data is showing that large-scale migration was common in our past. So now I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the history of Europe. This is not because Europe is a more important place than the rest of the world. It's not. It's just because it's where we happen to have the most data right now, three years into the ancient DNA revolution. Um, and so I'm going to tell you a story of this, not as, uh, as an exemplar of what's possible. So agriculture arrives in Europe sometime after 9,000 years ago from Anatolia, present-day Turkey, arrives in Greece and the Balkans, and then spreads to Britain within a few thousand years to Spain more rapidly and to uh, Sweden. And so spreading farmers were seen as the most likely vector for the spread of Indo-European languages. Another cultural phenomenon that is known from Europe is not from the archaeology, but rather from the languages that people speak. So in Europe, almost everybody, with some interesting exceptions like Basque and Hungarian and Finnish and Sami and Estonian, speak these tightly related languages that are also related to Armenian and to Iranian languages and to Northern Indian languages. So this has been known for 250 years. It's an amazing observation. And it still hasn't been explained up to the last few years. Genetics has made important strides in contributing to explaining why this is so. So it was thought that why are the languages all the same? Well, maybe this is because the languages were brought by the first farmers. This was the prevailing idea up till three years ago. But in fact, there was a later made large-scale migration that's almost certainly responsible for spreading these languages, and I'm going to show you the evidence for that. So with ancient DNA, we and others had co collected, beginning in, by 2015, data from a fair number of individuals who uh, were 5,000 years ago and earlier. And all of these individuals had one of two types of ancestries primarily. This blue type of ancestry, which is consistent with that of the hunter-gatherers of Europe, um, uh, or this orange type of ancestry, which was characteristic of the first Turkish farmers. Uh, farmers. So people were a mixture of farmer and hunter-gatherer ancestry. So today, though, when you apply the same analysis, there's a third ancestry type shown in green here uh, that had shown up. And so it must have shown up somewhere between 5,000 years ago and the present. So how did it get there? So this was a great mystery. We knew about this in 2014. We knew that today Europeans are comprised of three ancestral populations, but five years ago they were comprised of only two. So what happened? So this was very exciting. And we, of course, looked to try to see what happened by collecting samples that covered the period where we thought these transitions might have occurred. So three years before this, we had gotten our first clue about the existence and possible origin of the third source population for Europeans. And we got it in the following way. 
So we developed a statistical test. I'm a statistical geneticist by background, where we was a formal test for whether a population today is mixed. And the way it works is as follows. So typically, we look at data from a population, like French people today, and we look at them at 600,000 places in, the, in, in our DNA that are variable across people. And we can measure the frequency of DNA letter, like cytosine, thymine, adenine, so cytosine. It might be 30% in a large group of French people. And you can ask the question, on average, are the French people intermediate between any other pair of populations in your data set? And if they are, you can prove mathematically that the French people are the result of a mixture between at least two groups that are differently related to the two groups you're comparing them to. We call this the three population test. And we then, with this toy, this, this tool that we had, we applied it to all the populations we could. So we had a wonderful data set of 50 present day populations analyzed at about 600,000 positions. And for each population in the data set, we looked at all other possible of the 50 populations. And we saw, do they give a signal of mixture in, toward this target population? And when we took Northern European populations like French people, we got a huge signal of mixture. Um, when one population was Southern Europeans, like Sardinians, and the other population of all people was Native Americans. It was a crazy result, very strange result. It was a very strong result. And it was definitely Native Americans. It was not Siberians. It was not East Asians. It was not South Asians. And we, of course, didn't think that it was migration across the Atlantic from the Americas into Europe. Instead, we argued that sometime before 15,000 years, there was a population we called the ancient North Eurasians. We made this up. So this is a population called the ancient North Eurasians, which we argued existed sometime more than 15,000 years ago. And that population contributed to the population that moved across the Bering Land Bridge into the Americas. And some people from that population also later contributed to Europeans. So this was the first articulation of the idea of a ghost population, a theme that I return to again and again in the book, which is a population you statistically reconstruct from the mixed remains of it in people living later, but that you don't have access to in unmixed form. So it's a statistical prediction. So a year and a half later, a group working in Copenhagen in Denmark found this ghost population. They sequenced DNA from a 24,000-year-old little boy uh, who was buried near the shores of Lake Baikal in Siberia, which is the deepest freshwater lake in the world. And this individual was a better surrogate for French people than was the Native Americans. You can see that they're genetically related both to Native Americans and to Europeans, but not particularly closely related to people in that part of Siberia today. And that's the result of post-Ice Age movements from the south into that part of Siberia that displaced that population. So I'm now going to show you what we've, we and others have succeeded in reconstructing in terms of a time series of population turnovers in Western Eurasia. So here is a principal component analysis where we're taking data from about 800 present-day Europeans. So all of, most, all of these individual dots are from present-day Europeans or West Eurasian people. And you should think of the data going into this analysis as a rectangular grid, like an Excel spreadsheet where there's 600,000 rows corresponding to all the polymorphic, the, the variable genetic positions we're analyzing, where some people have an adenine and some people have a cytosine, um, A or a C. And the columns correspond to all 800 people in our data set. So it's an 800 by 600,000 grid. And in each cell of the grid is a 0, 1, or 2, depending on whether you have 0, 1, or 2 copies of the adenine. So you multiply the matrix by itself to get an 800 by 800 matrix, which shows how closely related every sample is to every other sample. And you perform the mathematical operation of principal component analysis, which finds combinations of, of these variable positions that best separate these samples from each other. And then you plot the x-axis is, is the variable that most separates the samples, and the y-axis is the second best variable. And when you do this to present-day Europeans, you see there's two parallel gradients that contain most of the samples. There's the one that contains Europeans, and there's the one that contains the Near Easterners, and a gap in between with relatively few populations. The populations that do exist in between are groups that are, have known or plausible more recent contacts between Europe and the Near East, such as island Mediterranean populations, Jewish populations, and Greek populations. <clears throat> 
At this end of the European gradient on the top is Northern Europeans. On the other end is Southern Europeans, especially Sardinians. In the Near East, this is uh, Ar Arme Ar Armenians at the top, Northern people from the Caucasus. And down here is, uh, Levantine, is, is Levantine people, such as people from Jordan and Israel and Arabia. So how does this arise? Well, I'm going to now gray out these points. So here's the two parallel gradients of present-day people in the Near East and in Europe. And I'm going to see where the ancient samples fall relative to these. So the hunter-gatherers of Europe, we have data from, fall beyond Europe in the direction of European differentiation from the Near East. And that's because Europeans are a mixture of these hunter-gatherers and Near Easterners. But the hunter-gatherers no longer exist in unmixed form. Then the first farmers of Europe, you see there's this rightward shift, move and fall on top of where present-day Sardinians are. That's because Sardinians today are a relatively isolated population that is relatively directly descended without much subsequent mixture from the first farmers who moved into that region. But you still don't see people like Europeans in most European countries today who are in this cloud over here. There's some mixture between the farmers and hunter-gatherers who haven't completely disappeared. Meanwhile, in Far Eastern Europe, 5,000 years ago, there's this formation of this Yamnaya population. Uh, and this population is a mixture of the Far Eastern European hunter-gatherers and samples that we now have data from who are here, who are Iranian farmers. And yet you still haven't seen people like uh, Europeans today. That only happens after 5,000 years ago, when suddenly you see people like Europeans today, and they come in in association with a culture called the corded ware culture, which is named after the pots that people made, which had decorations made by imprinted corded twine, twi cords of twine. And ever after in Europe, you see people like those living today. So a summary is that Europe was massively transformed by two migrations, one after 9,000 years ago, which brought in these first farmers, and almost all the ancestry of the first people was from farmers. There was some subsequent mixture between farmers and hunter-gatherers. And then, bang, after 5,000 years ago, this new ancestry arrives in association with this culture called the corded ware complex that is coming from the Yamnaya. In some populations, it replaces at least 70% of the ancestry of the populations. Who are these Yamnaya? So the Yamnaya were a population that spread over the steppe north of the Black of the Caspian Seas, shown in this blue shading here, beginning about 5,300 years ago. So they were the first people who brought the newly invented wheel out into the open steppe. So this was an important invention, and also the newly domesticated horse. And they hitched their horses to wagons and brought, brought supplies out to the open steppe lands, which were economically unexploitable before, because there was no water sources. And they used it to graze their cattle and their sheep out in the open steppe lands and were extremely successful. And so prior to the Yamnaya, there were many smaller uh, cultures that left their settlements in different pottery types across the region that the Yamnaya spread. And then with the Yamnaya, they almost all disappeared and were replaced by this homogeneous culture. The settlements, too, disappeared. And all that's left, for the most part, are these big graves that they left, big, rich graves. And it's uh, the archaeologists interpret this as people moving in, in mobile homes out into the open steppe and just moving from place to place. These people spread all the way from Hungary to Europe to Siberia to the Altai Mountains and left a massive impact. And genetically, the data is showing that they left a massive impact, too. So the um, implication also is that they likely spread languages. Because of this massive population replacement, it's thought that major movements of people also spread languages. And there is a long debate about how these languages, Indo-European languages, spread. And most people, the predominant view had recently been that must have been spread by farming, because how could there have been a major movement after the spread of farming into a place like Europe once there were densely settled people? How could step pastoralists, for example, make an impact? I don't know how they made an impact, but they did, because you see it in the genetic data. Um, so it's a very profound thing. Um, Indo-European languages are interesting because there's shared language, shared words all the way from India and Iran, all the way to uh, all of the spoken Indo-European languages for a whole set of t um, uh, words related to carts, horses, and wheels. Um, and that suggests that the languages shared a common ancestral language after the development of this techniques, and really is another reason why the Yamnaya are a plausible vector for the spread of these languages, and why it would be very hard to imagine that it was spread by farming, which uh, spread three or 4,000 years before. 
So I'm now going to tell you a little bit about the further spread of Indo-European languages, and in particular in Britain, where we have our best data. So at the same time that the corded ware complex was overspreading Eastern Europe, an equally impressive phenomenon as reflected in the pots people made and the tools people made and the buttons people buried in their burials and the whole series of ritual artifacts that were left behind in graves was spreading in Western Europe. And it was these bell beakers were one of the, it's named after the bell beakers, these bell-shaped beautiful pots that they made that first appear in Iberia in Spain about 4,700 years ago and then spread within 200 years to Central Europe. And once they get to Central Europe, they go everywhere. So they go to Britain, to Ireland, they go to Central Europe and they go all the way to Poland and to Hungary and to Southern and to Northern Italy. And a question that we wanted to ask is, what was the ancestry that was spread? In 2015, we had some samples from Germany where they had spread 200 years after they originated, and they were like the corded ware, lots of steppe ancestry. So we collected at the beginning of this year 400 new ancient DNA samples, um, and, uh, um, and many of them were from bell beaker associated burials. Here in red is where the bell beaker associated burials were. And we looked at their ancestry and we got a surprise. And the surprise is that in principal component analysis, the same type of analysis I showed you before, they were not all in the same place, not like the Yamnaya. So different from our previous supposition, it was tempting to think based on the previous work that always a genetic culture, people making pots in a certain way would correspond to people who all look genetically a certain way. But this is not the case with the bell beakers. They fall into two clusters, one over here, one over here. The cluster at the bottom is almost all Iberian people from Spain, where it first developed, and the cluster over here is almost all from Central Europe. And what we were able to show is that there's almost no shared ancestry between the Spanish practitioners of this culture and the Central European one. What that means is that the bell beaker culture spread between these two regions through communication of ideas, not through movement of people. Kind of like cell phones spread across people of different ancestries, a lot of archaeologists interpret the beaker burial tradition is a kind of ancient religion, and it's one that was clearly copied. In France and in Hungary, we even have graves where we have men and women buried side by side, both with beakers on their heads, neck buried next to their heads, but some of whom have steppe ancestry and some of whom didn't. So it's clearly a kind of proselytizing belief system which allowed new people to come in. So, but, so what we see is that there's not a lot of, of steppe ancestry in Spain, but there is a lot in, Euro in Central Europe. But once this belief system gets to Europe, it spreads further through migration and brings the ancestry with it. We know this best in the case of Britain, where we have 150 people that we reported at the beginning of this year, between 6,000 and 3,000 years ago. Here's a beautiful beaker burial in Britain. You see here's the beaker pot. There's a second burial with another beaker pot in this grave. And what you can see is that the people who brought this tradition replaced the population that had just built Stonehenge. So the last big stone, built stones at Stonehenge went up about 4,500 years ago. Um, and uh, at that time, the ancestry of the people was all blue. Uh, it was all first farmer type ancestry. But bang, at 4,400 years ago, every single sample has typically 90% or more steppe ancestry. So there's a mass movement into Britain that essentially almost completely replaces the local population. And people in Britain today are largely descended from this new wave of people and share very little ancestry from the people who built Stonehenge. In Iberia and Spain, meanwhile, at almost exactly the same time, we see something very similar. This is a different type of plot, but this y-axis is measuring the proportion of ancestry from the Far East, and ultimately from the Yamnaya. And what you see is that there's no change between 6,000 and 2,000, uh, 6,000 and 4,000 years ago in terms of the proportion of steppe ancestry. Um, but then beginning 4,500 years ago, a new group, the steppe ancestry people, begin to come in Iberia. There's a 500 or 300 year period of overlap, and then the two groups mix together. The mixed population is not as dramatic as what you see in Britain. It's 60% from the indigenous local farmer population, 40% from the steppe people. But the coloring of these dots is the males in this group, and we're coloring them by their Y chromosome type. So there are typical farmer Y chromosome types, which are colored here in different shades of blue, and different steppe Y chromosomes types, which are colored here in red. And what you see is that after 4,000 years ago, the farmer Y chromosomes completely disappeared. It was 100% Y chromosome replacement. And what this is telling you is that only 40% of the ancestry in this population 
is from the step people, but 100% of the Y chromosomes are. So what that means is that the people coming in completely displaced the local males. That is, they had preferential access to local females, and their kids had prefer, and their the newcomers kept having preferential to access to local females generation after generation. So it's telling you about a complex interaction about these between these groups, which could have hardly been a simple interaction. <clears throat> so the fourth lesson and the final lesson in humility uh, pertains to South Asia. And it uh, pertains to something that has been the longest standing interest that I've had in human population history. And in 2009, we analyzed modern data from 130 uh, people from 25 groups in India, and we came up with a model of South Asian population history where most groups in India today are mixtures in different proportions between two highly divergent ancestral population. One we call the ancestral North Indian, related deeply to Europeans and Central Asians and Near Easterners, and the other we call the ancestral South Indian, related deeply to East Asians and indigenous other peoples of East Asians. And people in India today are mixtures in different proportions of these two groups. We were able to quantify the proportions of ancestry from each of these two groups, and they ranged from about 20% related to Europeans and Near Easterners to 80%. And they were correlated people with relatively more West Eurasian ancestry, tended to speak more into European languages, and tended to be even controlling for that, have traditionally higher status in the traditional caste system in India. So last year, we tried to look at this much harder with 250 or so groups, uh, with shown here in the dots on the map, color-coded by the languages people speak, language groups. So in India today, there are many language groups, but they can ca categorize in a few language families. So the maroon color is Indo-European languages related to the languages I told you about before in Europe. The blue is Dravidian languages, which are very distantly related and we're not obvious, it's not clear what the relationship is all. The, the triangles here are Tibeto-Burman languages related to Chinese and there's also these Austroasiatic languages in red, but I'm gonna talk about the Indo-European and Dravidian here. So the hypothesis we entered into at the beginning of our work in 2016 was that the ancestral North Indians, the ones with the West Eurasian relatedness, were a mixture of steppe-related and Iranian-related ancestry. We already knew from work that we had done in the meantime that both of those components contributed to India, and that the ancestral South Indians had no West Eurasian-related ancestry. So we were wrong about this, and it was really interesting how this happened, and I'm gonna tell you how we were wrong. So we now have this model of three sources that works as a model for India. One of them is steppe, one of them is Asian, you know, related to East Asians and indigenous people from South Asia, and the other is Iranian. And we were able to quantify in these diverse groups the proportions of ancestry from diverse Indian groups today shown with these plus signs here. And if you extend this gradient, you can see there's a gradient of different proportions of ancestry. And if you extend this gradient as far to the top of the plot as possible, you get to what's expected if there's no step ancestry at all, where you intersect this green line. And what you notice is it doesn't intersect at this vertex of all Asian ancestry like we thought. It actually intersects in the middle of this line. And what that means is that the ancestral South Indians had a lot of Iranian-related ancestry. They were not a non-West Eurasian population. They already had had about 30% Iranian ancestry, and that suggests that the Iranian ancestry, which plausibly brought, was related to the spread of farming technology, was already in the ancestral South Indians when the mixture occurred. So this was extremely interesting, and we wanted to look at it harder in light of ancient DNA. So this is a bad map, but this is a map of Central Asia and Northern South Asia, and we now have ancient DNA that's not yet published, uh, but we're, begin we're working it toward publication of 550 new samples, 200 from Kazakhstan and Russia, uh, 200 from Iran and uh, uh, Central Asia in parts of the, that historically have had, has had Iranian-related ancestry and sometimes languages, so from Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, and about 140 sample from the Swat Valley of northern Pakistan, where we, a little bit of data from northern South Asia. So with this huge ancient DNA sample size, which is possible with this new technological revolution for generating data, we actually can do something we couldn't do before. This is one of the many things you can do by pumping up the sample size. You can look not just at the main cluster of people, but you can look at the outliers. So in this room, if we were analyzing and sampling just four people in this room, 
we might all look like we're from the same group, but if we analyzed 80 people from the group, we'll see different people, and those different people will be informative about what's happening in the city of Seattle. There's a primary group of people, and there are secondary groups, and we'll be able to see that. So this is exactly what we see at towns like this one. This is Gonor Tepe. This is a, one of the four towns we have data from, from what's something called the Bactria Margiana archaeological complex. It was one of the great civilizations of the ancient world 4,000 years ago, and the first, one of the first and it was only discovered by archaeologists in the 1990s. They made these great walled towns. And genetically, most of the individuals are similar to contemporary Iranians from around the same time, but there are outliers. And we were able to study the outliers, and the outliers are almost the most interesting part. Prior to 4,000 years ago, the outliers look like other samples we have from Western Siberia and from Kazakhstan who have hunter-gatherer ancestry. So the Iranian-related primary group who were burying their dead in the cemeteries outside this town were mixing and interacting with a little bit with these local hunter-gatherer-related populations. After 4,000 years ago, people descended from Yamnaya steppe pastoralists, or the outliers, or the primary outliers. In Kazakhstan, north of this region, a little bit before that is when these people come in. So we're actually seeing the wave of advance of these steppe pastoralist descendants hitting these towns. They don't take over these towns. The towns are still primarily occupied by these Iranian-related people. But archaeologically, we actually see their encampments outside the towns. There's people who make different types of buildings and different types of pots. They're trading. And sometimes they get integrated into the cemeteries in this town. In the Pakistani samples we have from 3,000 years ago, we have the steppe ancestry is already in Pakistan uh, 3,000 years ago, and we can see through the size of the chunks, it's already been there for 500 years. So that allows us to bracket the arrival of steppe ancestry into South Asia, where today it, can it comp comprises up to 30% of the ancestry of some populations between 4,000 and 3,500 years ago. So in this way, in the talk that I've given here today, We've now established chains of transmission of this Yamnaya steppe ancestry into Europe and South Asia between 5,000 and 3,500 years ago that tracks very well the spread of Indo spoken Indo European languages, and it even tracks features of the way those languages are related, like funny features such as Balto Slavic languages have a particular relatedness to Indo Iranian languages. So what's particularly exciting about the South Asian work is that we actually also have now data that probably comes from a civilization that was to the south of the Bactria Margiana complex, which was in Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, this one from South Asia itself. So around the same time as the Bactria Margiana civilization, around the Indus Valley and other regions of present-day South Asia, northwestern South Asia especially, there are these great towns that are formed, like Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa. And we don't have data from those towns. However, we have data from outlier individuals living in their periphery. So we have from eastern Iran and from Gonor, the same town I showed you before, we have outlier individuals who don't look anything like the other people there. These towns both have close cultural contacts with the Indus Valley civilization. There are seals from the Indus Valley civilization found in their artifacts and many, a lot of evidence of, tra of contact and exchange between these places. These people, all 14 of these individuals, are a mixture of typical South Indian-related ancestry, which is not seen in the rest of the samples, and a different type of Iranian ancestry. So we think we're seeing migrants from a cosmopolitan population to the southeast. And so here is our updated model of Indian population history. So uh, to now we think of India as a mixture of late uh, Bronze Age uh, pastoralists descended from the Yamnaya. Um, and uh, an ancient Iranian population and, and gradients of different proportions in this Indus periphery, Indus Valley civilization samples of these two poles, Asian and Iranian. So this gradient existed more than 4,000 years ago, and we have multiple samples along it now from ancient DNA from Iran and Turkmenistan, kind of like if you sampled here from Seattle, you would see immigrants from other countries, and you would be, get a picture of what the ancestry was like. Then the steppe pastoralists come in between 4,000 and 3,500 years ago, and we see multiple samples in Pakistan that are in different proportions on this line from the steppe 
to a point that we haven't directly sampled, but we've close to sampled from this existing pre-existing gradient. There's an unsampled point on this gradient, but we think it must have existed where we think the ancestral North Indians must have lived. And people in India today are mixtures of these two mixed populations. So three gradients, the one 4,000 years ago and before, the one between three and 4,000 years ago, and then this mixture of mixed populations. Pulling outward toward Eurasia, one way to think of Eurasia is as, as a core region with two peripheral peninsulas, one of them being Europe, one of them being India, with two parallel histories. Agriculture develops 12 to 11,000 years ago in the Near East. That's where agriculture first develops. It spreads about the same time to each of these regions into Europe from Turkey about 9,000 years ago, into South Asia from Iran about 9,000 years ago takes a few thousand years to spread across each of these regions because of the climatic challenges that need to be overcome for West Asian crops to spread into the complicated climatic zones in each of the regions. Meanwhile, in the steppe, after 5,000 years ago, the Yamnaya spread to the peripheries of each of these regions and its mixtures of these mixed populations that form the primary gradient of each of these groups today, producing a mix of three ancestral populations, hunter-gatherers, farmers, and Yamnaya steppe pastoralists. So a summary, and this is a picture of a Yamnaya individual that we got data from, ancient DNA is teaching us again and again that much of what we thought we knew is wrong, um, that we're all mixed and that no one is pure. And I, this is an unusual field where scratching the surface is guaranteed to surprise. I was prior to working, uh, uh, to writing this book, which I decided to do five years ago, uh, I just wanted to write papers all the time. And I People would say, you should write a book, or you know, I want to find out about what this is going on, uh, what's going on, but I just wanted to write papers, more and more papers, because it was so exciting to work on this. But it became increasingly clear that it was impossible to understand what was going on in this field through the journalistic articles about it. And people, even people super interested, like members of the public, but also archaeologists and linguists and historians whose work was being impacted by these findings, just couldn't interact with our cryptic papers that were written in jargon. And so I decided to write this book to try to explain it to anybody who was interested without jargon. It's a sort of serious book. So it's actually, uh, you know, not, not uh, but it's, it's hopefully readable um, because I think it's really important to try to understand what this is finding. And we're, of course, clearly only just at the beginning. There are so many things to do. Uh, we're, you know, Europe is just a tiny corner part of the world. We've, there's many times in, in not just uh, European history, but all parts of the world which we can access with this technology. We can learn, you know, how often migration occurs, how often mixture occurs, what the tempo of it is. We can learn about frequency changes of mutations that affect biology. And it's so exciting to work on this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for writing the book. Thank you very much for coming to talk about the book to uh, a broad public audience. Um, some members of the alt-right movement have misused your book and your New York Times op-ed to um, suggest that genetics can now be used to distinguish human races. Um, some academics have suggested that a sociologist as a co-author might have been a um, way to prevent such hijacking of your ideas and your thoughts. Going forward, um, what is your what is your view on the role of geneticists such as yourself and their role in the discussion of such um, uh, questions about race and, um, social, and, and, and society? Sure, thank you. The, um, thank you for the question, which is an important question. Um, I think that uh, geneticists um, are the experts on the nature of human variation. And, uh, I think that the message that's been coming from the genetics community for the last 50 years has really been a very simple message, which is that the differences among human populations are very small relative to the differences across individuals. That's true insofar as it goes, but yet the differences across populations on average are not trivial. And so I think it's very important to be able to communicate that because as science advances, whether we like it or not, medical geneticists are going to be able to be measuring differences uh, in genetic traits that will differ on average across populations. And it will be po impossible to uh, 
get away from these findings. So I think we geneticists need to provide guidance for how to think about the nature of population differences. So race itself is a social construct. It changes over time. For example, definitions of what it is to be an African American were what are different uh, in 100 years ago than they are today. Definitions of what it means to be black is in Brazil is different from what it is in this country. Uh, some definitions of race have nothing to do with ancestry at all, especially in Latinos, for example. It doesn't correspond to a homogeneous group in any way at all. But we need, as geneticists, to provide guidance because if we don't, that vacuum will be filled by people just making up stories about the nature of differences amongst groups and that the genetics is suggesting that it corresponds to long-held stereotypes. But what the genetics is showing again and again is that what we thought is wrong? And so I think that this is the sort of thing we need to be able to be discussing. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for again to come to for coming to Seattle. So finding actually human um, or hominid fossils is really difficult, but presumably um, it's much easier to find animals that traveled with um, were domesticated or or they were forced by ice age migration. They were forced to move. Um, could uh, like applying the same techniques on on other species um, help or provide extra data set or augment the models? Yeah, so um, looking at animal ancient DNA, that's an incredibly interesting area as well. And there's been really amazing work, especially in dogs and in uh, cattle and in horses, which have shown big transformations of these domesticated animals with the movements of people, but also of wild animals such as elephants or passenger pigeons. And in, in some ways, the opportunities there are even richer th than for humans. And so I think that uh, there's all sorts of skeletal remains. It's not true that there are not a lot of human skeletons. So if you dig a highway here, for example, you will run into many, many human skeletons or almost anywhere in the world and people are excavating them all the time. I mean, here it's a complicated issue because it's Native American skeletons and I think special attention needs to be placed and care in analyzing them. But there's, there are, in the last 10,000 years, literally millions of skeletons that we're uncovering all the time, and so there's not a limitation uh, in terms of being able to analyze data from this period. What are your current thoughts on the origin of the Native Americans um, and the challenges of trying to figure out the details of that? So, so could you explain more about your question there? Well, where, where did the... Um, Native Ameri the first Americans come from? So, so I don't think the genetics sheds much specific light on that because we don't have ancient DNA from the exact time and place when Native Americans first arised. Genetic data doesn't give you any information about mo so, uh, uh, th where exactly people were unless you actually have data from the individual. And we don't have individuals who are on the Bering Land Bridge we have DNA from. However, what the genetic data says is that all present-day Native Americans, with small exceptions, the great majority of the ancestry descends from a single homogeneous ancestral population, which was already in place in the Americas at the time of the oldest excavated skeletons that we have now, which are almost 13,000 years old, for which we have data. And so what's very clear is that most Native American ancestry descends from a common stem population population at that time, and there's some additional interesting events that happened since then. And the origin being Siberia? Or? Ah, Native Americans, uh, in terms of their relationships to Eurasian groups, are a mixture of about two-thirds ancestry related deeply to East Asians and one-third ancestry related deeply to this ancient North Eurasian population I talked about um, at the beginning of my talk. Thank you. Hi. Um, the traditional story of man is that like Homo sapiens are 150,000 or 200,000 years old, and then we left Africa 50,000 years ago. But with, since we interbred with, with Neanderthals, and we had healthy offspring, and we interbred with Denisovians, had a healthy offspring, Neanderthals interbred with Denisovians and had healthy offspring, is that an incorrect way that we're really saying species? Because aren't we really then a 1.2 or 1.3 million year old species that has gone in and out of Africa probably on multiple times because we have these other type of groups and that it's kind of a misnomer that we're a species that's 200,000 years old and separate from Denisovians and Neanderthals. 
else? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, we struggled with it a lot in our collaboration. I actually describe this extensively in my book, our conversations about this. So species are defined in the biological literature as groups that do not in practice interbreed with each other. And what you see in the ancient DNA data is that when ancient humans, or archaic humans, were in contact with each other, they were interbreeding all the time and producing offspring. And in fact, many people in the world descend today descend from mixtures between archaic and modern humans um, in different parts of the world in different proportions. And so what does this mean about whether these different groups of humans were distinct species or not? So when we wrote our papers, we had discussions with some of our archaeologists and anthropologists co-authors who were very strongly arguing that we should name Neanderthals Homo neanderthalensis or call the newly discovered Denisovans Homo altaiensis or something like this. And we had a principal decision that this was not our business as geneticists. In fact, the genetic data, there was already some debate about whether these should be called distinct species or not, the separation time between Neanderthals and modern humans and Denisovans is about half a million years. Different groups of chimpanzees separated by half a million years are called subspecies, not different species. Um, the anthropologists argued that morphologically these were Neanderthals and modern humans were a very distinct group and maybe should be considered species, but we just punted. And what we said is we're just going to call them by colloquial names, Neanderthals and Denisovans, after the first places they were discovered, and we're not going to make a statement and leave it to other people. But for me, the boundary between what a species is and not is not so important. What's very clear is that the mixture between Neanderthals and modern humans and Denisovans and modern humans produced a lot of natural selection. So if you look at the genomes of non-Africans today, there have been segments of Neanderthal DNA that have been removed through the action of natural selection. So for example, there's a deficiency of Neanderthal ancestry near genes compared to far away from genes. And that can only be due to natural selection pushing away the Neanderthal ancestry, which is a toxic on a modern human back, a genetic background. Background. And so this is clearly groups that were far enough away that the genomes had to kind of react to the insult of, of, of mixture between two such different populations, which we know from other species when they mix, produces even greater natural selection. But I don't know what to think about the nature of these groups. Thank you for your talk. I have two questions. Uh, the first is kind of about the um, uh, molecular property of the DNA. So I worked with, I've worked with bacterial genome, and you know, in lab, you're very careful not to um, expose it to the cycles of time freeze, just because the DNA is very uh, prone to fragmentation. But I'm very curious, um, how has this ancient DNA survived over such um, extreme environmental conditions and uh, while being exposed to many bacterial strains, many enzymes that could easily degrade the DNA. Um, I was just simply naively thinking maybe um, by after so many years we just end up with uh, different nucleotides, you know, rather than even just um, short segments. And the second question is, uh, as human species, have we um, improved uh, with regard to us being uh, resistant to diseases over time? Uh, in other words, have we uh, increased the diversity in our DNA or um, have we decreased it? Because on one side, the lifestyle has um, diverged, uh, has converged actually, but um, on the other side, uh, like you were presenting, you know, uh, based on the segmentation of the DNA, you're actually uh, being able to calculate how um, diverse the DNA um, over generations have become. So, yeah. Thank you. Two great and very different questions. So the first question is the preservation of DNA, and it's a complete miracle. DNA is a very stable molecule. RNA is a very unstable molecule, but DNA is a very stable molecule, and in bones, it seems to bind to hydroxyapatite after the cells, which is a, which is a basic uh, a mineral material in bone, after the cells break apart, um, and is a relatively stably bound for a long period of time. It doesn't survive very well in soft tissue. So for example, if you look at an Egyptian mummy or a or a individual, like the Iceman, preser preserved in cold for a long time, the soft tissue doesn't preserve the DNA nearly as well as the bones, which happens to be a good preservation condition. So it's like an incredible piece of luck that this is a stable molecule that lasts for so long. 
Um, the oldest DNA that's been successfully obtained from a mammal is from about 700,000 years ago for a complete genome of a horse from Alaska. But there's even DNA from temperate humans from 400,000 years ago from Spain that's substantially preserved. Um, your other question um, was uh, about, um, could you just remind me for a second what your other question was about? Disease? Disease, um, right. So, so disease, um, the, uh, that's an interesting question, whether we're more or less resistant to disease than we were before. Um, I don't think the, uh, we've really answered that in a meaningful way with ancient DNA. Um, so uh, sort of a general comment is that um, uh, you know, we're living in more dense conditions than we used to be uh, before to infectious disease. So we're exposed to many more uh, diseases before than people perhaps were a long time ago. On the other hand, you know, in the last couple of hundred, last hundred years, I think that um, we've been propped up by a lot of medical care and it's possible that uh, the natural selection that has always been pressured on us to, to preserve uh, resistance has been weakened and you know, maybe, maybe we're becoming more susceptible on average to a number of things. Uh, I have two questions, a very uh, technical question and a more broad question. The technical one, you confidently um, uh, uh, called dates. Is that from radiocarbon dating? Uh, which dates are you talking about? Well, when you say this happened, you know, this is from a, 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 a sample from 3,500 years ago. Correct. This is a sample. Okay. Correct. Radiocarbon dating is a very precise technology and, and is pretty accurate in terms of the dating within a small um, coefficient of variation. Great. My other question, I mean, uh, you, this is, I mean, you've, in just a few years, you've discovered so many things that are big surprises that I know it's hard to project from that to the future. But some things you can project to, to the future, Moore's Law and the number of samples and that sort of thing. So my, my more general question is, where do you see this going in the next you know, 10 years, 25 years, 50 years? So I think what's gonna happen in the next 10 years is really communal, as a community, we ancient DNA specialists are gonna build kind of an ancient DNA atlas of of humanity, of all of the ancient skeletons that's possible to get DNA from over the last 50,000 years, which is where there are a lot of skeletons available from all different cultures all around the world. And so we're gonna be able to build an atlas, a map of how different ancient people are related to each other and to people today. We're gonna to be able to draw, uh, figure out which groups replaced which groups, which groups mixed with which groups, how the rate of migration between all of these groups and their relative contributions to people today. And so that will be an atlas building or a map building communal effort. And interpreting that will be a rich source of data for the future. I think that there's another access to this that's gonna be, if anything, even more rewarding, which is that the language, we geneticists speak a language which is very different from that that sociologists and historians and anthropologists and linguists speak, but we're talking about the same thing. So we need to learn to speak across disciplines and need to adjust and uh, translate our, our, what we find and also learn from people in those fields how to contextualize our results better. And so what you're gonna see, see is an integration of genetics into these other fields where they properly belong. So I'm pretty excited about that too. Great, thank you. So I was just curious, when you talk about um, analyzing variation between genomes, it sounds like you're talking on the genomic level. Is there any research you've done or analysis into what parts of the genome might be changing more or less than others? Like, are they the non-coding part? Are they like, you know, physical attributes, digestive things? Like, I was just curious if that's been something that which parts of the surface. genome are mutating and changing more or more conserved under natural selection? Yeah, so. Uh, we know a lot about that, um, and we know a lot about the relative rates of mutation, and so there's, um, for example, certain uh, DNA letters and combinations of DNA letters, like cytosines and guanines net together, are much more mut mut mutation prone than others uh, due to the chemical processes and the way that replication works. Um, and uh, in genes and other important biological segments, the sequence is conserved due to the action of natural selection removing uh, bad mutations which uh, affect function there. And so if you look at pairs of uh, species that are diverged, there'll, there'll be more sequence similarity on those regions because of the selection to, to remove those errors. Cool. Thank you.
I'm going to have to preface this with I promise it's a serious question. Uh, it is an argument that's been going on in my department at my school for about eight months now. From a genetic and archaeological standpoint, is there a hard line between archaeology and grave robbing? And grave robbing. Yeah. <laughs> so the question is, from a genetic and archaeological standpoint, is there a hard line? But so, we, so I think that's a very serious question. And what we're doing, actually, in ancient DNA is we're opening up ancient skeletons, uh, perhaps from people who would not have liked their skeletons to be um, sampled. And I think that when we do this work, uh, we have to, in every case, keep in mind that these are the bones of real people and who may or may not wish to have had their skeleton sampled. And we need to think about what we're doing and weigh the costs and benefits of doing that analysis. So some of the arguments that are, put, that are suggested often when people talk about this is you should ask the question, are these connected to a present day people who might have some cultural connection to these bones? So that's often the litmus test used to determine uh, whether you should be able to analyze the skeletal remains. For example, a Muslim burial, we Muslims are still all over the place and have very strong feelings about opening up of graves. Maybe we shouldn't open up a Muslim grave because there are present day Muslims that would violate their feelings. But I think that why should we actually think just that's important? In the ancient Egyptian tomb, it's very clear those people didn't want their graves being violated. Their belief system was that their body should be intact. They protected their tombs, but there's no people who believe in that particular religious system anymore. But should we respect those people by not opening up their tombs? So I think that, uh, we I, I think that there is an argument to be made that ex obtaining data from ancient skeletons breaks down barriers between people, shows that people are related in ways different from what they thought, and actually shows that people are more similar to each other than a lot of people would have thought before in a way that draws connections between people, and I think that that's a mitigating factor. But I think you have to, in each case, do it in a case-by-case -case basis, and it varies between each part of the world, and often we shouldn't do this. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Question back there. The origin of the term Yamnaya, and does it have anything to do with the Yamato? And I am not a linguist, and I do not know the origins of these terms, but I doubt that there's a connection between those two terms, but that's an uninformed opinion. Yamnaya. I do not know the, the, the etymology of that term. I think that's what you're asking. What does it mean to you? It's a name of an, of an archaeological uh, uh, culture uh, associated with a particular style of burial and set of uh, material artifacts that are associated with these people. Other questions? I have a question. This, this is the last question right here. Okay, um, so when, when a group like the Yamnaya do come into an area, can you tell if it, there's some sort of genetic superiority or, or, or a benefit rather than just a sheer numbers? You know, if there's thousands of people moving, it seems like that would present itself in the, in the gene record without necessarily being a better, quote, better set of genes, or is it the other way around, or, or can you tell the difference? I'd be extremely... Um, skeptical of a claim that these changes were driven by genetic um, traits that some okay. people had more than others. I think we see again and again in our modern society of group examples of groups colliding with each other that you know just have different cultures or different technologies you know that run over or diseases they're carrying that run over each other in different ways. And I think this is reflecting cultural differences and luck um, uh, or you know ways of being and ways of uh, moving and ways of organizing life. And I think that that's almost certainly what we're seeing. I think a stab I mean, there might be small genetic contributions to some of these changes, but I would guess they would be overwhelmed by cultural ones. That's my bias. Yeah. Unless like some like disease, you know, for... There could be disease. Europeans coming into North America. Yeah, so, the, so one, interesting, there, one interesting yeah. observation, and I talk about this in detail in my book, um, is that these steppe pastoralists... Uh, the grave, uh, this group in, in Denmark discovered after 
um, sequencing DNA from these early Bronze Age people, including Yamnaya, that uh, many of them, maybe 10% of the ones in the first study they studied, or maybe 5 to 10%, carried the Black Death pathogen. So an early form of the Black Death. Um, and this was you know, well before the 1347 you know, Great Black Death. Um, and the fact that they had it in their teeth when they died almost certainly means they died of it because you don't have bacteria in your bloodstream normally. And so uh, one possibility that um, they sp speculated in their paper and is quite an interesting possibility but is far from proven is that what actually happened is that um, a disease like this one spread was, was, was endemic in a group like the Yamnaya um, and wasn't... Uh, present in a naive group like Central European farmers and was introduced from the steppe and resulted in a kind of decimation of the local population, which made room for the people coming in from the east demographically, even though they weren't as densely spread on the landscape, they were pastoralists rather than farmers, it made it possible for them to expand. And that would be ironic if true, because in the same way, much long after, as you said, uh, Native Americans sort of encountered European diseases from these very people uh, who perhaps were impacted by similar phenomena themselves earlier. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for coming.